What language did they speak in Moldova? <sighs> it's not simple. <laughs> if you will go to Moldova and if you will ask random person, what language are you speaking? You can get to answers. Um, first of those answers would be Romanian, obviously. And, but the second one would be Moldovan. I'm speaking Moldovan. And you can say, ah, so you're speaking Romanian Moldovan. No, 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 sir. I'm speaking Moldovan. And would it mean that he's speaking some different language? Uh, no, he would be speaking exactly the same language as all the other Moldovans, even those who, are, who claim that they are speaking Romanian. The fact that he or she would be uh, naming this language Moldovan uh, would be kind of a identity or political declaration. Hello, my name is Nicholas Furnival. You're watching or listening to an OSW interview. Today I'll be talking to Kamil Tsaus, an expert from OSW on Romania and Moldova. We'll be discussing Moldova's geopolitical status and whether that is likely to change. So I've been doing my own research for this interview and I discovered that there is a region in Romania called Moldova, there is a river called Moldova, and of course there is a country called Moldova. How do these three interact with each other? Well, actually, there are two rivers uh, called Moldova. Uh, one of them is located in the region of Moldova, and the second one is uh, located in the Czech Republic. And it's called in English Vltava, or Vltava in Polish. It's the river which crosses the Prague, and uh, therefore can be recognized by by our view viewers. The, the, the name is, uh, the, the name Moldau works for this river only in German, but that's kind of a, of a joke. So, uh, yeah. Technically speaking, Moldova uh, first and foremost is the geographical region. It's the region which um, is located in Romania and uh, eastern northeastern part of Romania, and historically also on the territory of the today country, which is called Republic of Moldova. Generally speaking, we need to probably get back in the, into the history for a moment. I, I assume it's one contiguous area. Uh, yes, yes, it is. So since 14th century, uh, there was principality called Principality of Moldova. And it was located uh, on the territory of today Republic of Moldova, not the whole one without Transnistria, but probably we'll be talking about this in a moment. And in this aforementioned um, uh, north uh, eastern part of the uh, today Romania. And there is a river called Moldova, which crosses uh, today's Moldova located in the Romania. Yeah, it's okay. it's kind of tricky, but there is a reason why it's like that. We have to go, go back to 1812. So before 1812, Principality of Moldova was one integral territory. In 1812, Russia, Russian Empire annexed um, eastern part of this, uh, of this uh, entity uh, up to the river Prut. And uh, then a uh, few decades passed, uh, Principality of Moldova, the, the rest of it, right, the one which remained uh, independent from Russia, united with Valachia. Mm -hmm. This is the principality to the um, south from, from Moldova and in general this is the southern Romania today. And those both principalities formed what we know today as Romania. That was the first Romanian state, the Romanian kingdom. So basically yeah, this is how it works. But uh, the rest of Principality of Moldova, the eastern part, remained in the Russian Empire, right? We remember that. Then in 1918, um, after the Russian Revolution, Romania re managed to regained this territory. Romania was uh, arguing that, well, those were the lands which belonged to the Principality of Moldova, were therefore inherently Romanian and should be returned. And therefore Romania... And culturally it. Romanian in those days? Uh, were, they, were they culturally Romanian in those days? Those people on this territory annexed by Russia? Yes. <sighs> it's complicated. Ethnically, they were. Uh, Language-wise, they were. I mean, they were speaking Moldovan dialect of the Romanian language. But um, the problem is that when this territory was annexed by the Russian Empire, local population, mostly peasants, uh, were not you know, Romanized in this modern way. They were not aware of their uh, national identity because 
in this moment in time, at the beginning of 19th century, there was really no one modern Romanian identity yet. It was created only, or it started to develop qu quite quickly in the mid 19th century. But because those people were already in this time in the Russian Empire, were part of the Russian Empire, they were kind of shielded, protected, let's say, from this process of Romanization, Romanization of this building of a Romanian nation. Therefore, when this territory was an, uh, was reenacted, reannexed re re by by Romania in 1918, uh, well, those people were, let's say, at least part of them were confused. They understood that they are speaking the same language. They understood that they are Orthodox, like their Romanian counterparts, let's say, from, from the another bank of the river. Uh, but at the same time, they were not fully sure about their Romanianness, their, 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 their identity. So they had to be, um, as Romanians would put it, or as Bucharest would put it, re-Romanized. They would have to be uh, taught that they are actually part and the members of the wider Romanian nations as Wallachians, as Transylvanians, as Moldovans from the um, left bank, uh, sorry, right bank of the of the Prut River, so from the western bank of the Prut River. So that's that's the story when it comes to when it comes to uh, Moldova. Now this territory, the one which was re-annexed by Romania in 1918, was again lost by Romania uh, because of the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact. Actually, in Poland, particularly, but not only in Poland, most of the world. Uh, remember that Recog that, that uh, Ribbentrop Molotov Pact was mostly about the division of Poland, actually between Germany and uh, Soviet Union. But in fact, there were additional points in this document, and one of them was actually mentioning um, the so-called Bessarabia. Now we have to introduce this name as well. Bessarabia is this part of the wider Moldova, which today is the Republic of Moldova. More or less, not fully, because again, there's Transnistria, which is not a part of Bessarabia, but don't, let's, let's don't get too much into details. Now, the present. Uh, exactly. <laughs> And after the Second World War, Soviet Union created on this annexed territory Moldovan Socialist, uh, Soviet Socialist Republic. And this is why today, after 1991, so after Moldova um, declared independence, we've got Republic of Moldova on the one hand and the region on, of Moldova on the other bank of the, of the Prut River. So this is why we have those two names. So generally speaking, both Republic of Moldova without Transnistria, but still. And the region of Romania called Moldova, they belong to one historical region called Moldova, the region which once in time was called Principality of Moldova. This is why we have this, this, this m m those multiply, multiplied Moldovas and uh, river is there as well. So that's how it works. Okay, that was very complicated. Uh, I There's also a dog in the story, I may add. Could you please tell us of about Of course. That? I mean, there is a legend uh, about the name of the country and the region as such. So there is a legend from 13th, 14th century about Dragos. Dragos was a uh, voevod. Voevod is like a war leader in, uh, in, in this region, in Poland, in Romania. And so his name was Dragos and he was preparing to fight. He was gathering his army and he was moving toward uh, the skirmish, let's say. And he had his uh, faithful dog with him called Molda. And the dog was also very energetic and he started to chase the bison, which he met. And unfortunately, uh, he clashed and he started to fight with this, with this bison and bison obviously won this battle and the dog died. And therefore it, it all happened on the, on the bank of the river, the river which was then named after this dog by Dragos Molda. And this is how the whole region gained its name, this is why the, re the river is also called like that. Uh, that's probably not the uh, true et etymological origin of the name, but it's a very popular legend and it works in Romania and Moldova, you can hear it there. Well, one to remember. So my next question I'm hoping is simpler. What language did they speak in Moldova? It's not simple. <laughs> I mean, okay, it is simple uh, from the linguistic point of view. Um, lang from the linguistic point of view, it's Romanian uh, in its Moldovan form. So it's a Moldovan dialect of the Romanian language. Uh, the difference from the, like, the, let's say, classic uh, 
uh, literature, uh, Romanian is more or less uh, as follows. There is a difference in accent, which is a little bit more frolic, let's say. It's 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 uh, it's a little bit more similar to the in general Eastern uh, European languages, um, and there are certain grammar constructs which are straight from, for example, Russian or Ukrainian language. Let's say that that's a good example. Um, if you want to sell a house or some property in Romania, you would put a sign on it, de vinzare, which means exactly for sale. Vinza, vinzare means to sale and so on. And But in Moldova, you would probably write se vinde, which means it, it would be hard to and translate it for in, in English. Like but is being sold. Is being sold, exactly. Which is very much, which is a very typical form uh, used in the Ukrainian language, in Russian language. It can be used in Polish language as well uh, with this reflective verb, so-called mm-hmm. reflective verb. And this is just one of many, many examples. There are much more. So there are certain words which are typical only for the Moldovan variant of uh, Romanian language, but nobody has got any doubts that it's still Romanian. The differences are not larger. I think that they are even smaller than in different dialects of German, for example, language. Uh, not to mention uh, English. Not uh, to mention English. Not to mention English, definitely. So there are differences, but people from Moldova speaking Romanian Moldovan can easily communicate with Romanians on the other side of the Prut River. Uh, but despite that, there is also, despite this linguistic layer, let's say, there's also political layer, which is far more important. If you will go to Moldova and if you will ask random person, what language are you speaking? You can get two uh, answers. Um, the first of those answers would be Romanian, obviously. and But the second one would be Moldovan. I'm speaking Moldovan. And you can say, ah, so you're speaking Romanian Moldovan. No, 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 sir. I'm speaking Moldovan. And would it mean that he's speaking some different language? Uh, no, he would be speaking exactly the same language as all the other Moldovans, even those who, are, who claim that they are speaking Romanian. The fact that he or she would be uh, naming this language Moldovan uh, would be kind of a identity or political declaration. Now, again, we need to get back uh, in the history for a moment. So when Soviet Union created Moldovan Socialist, Soviet Socialist Republic after the Second World War, they imposed the official ideology, uh, not only the communistic one, of course, but also the identity ideology, historical ideology called Moldovanism. And this ideology went as follows. So uh, Moldovans are actually separate nations from Romania. Now, why? I mean, how come? Uh, we just said that they were members of the Moldovan Principality and Moldovan Principality formed Romania with Wallachia. So why Why it's a different, different state? Well, Soviet social engineers would say that, uh, well, it's easy. So once there was Moldovan nation living in the Moldovan Principality since 14th century, let's say, uh, and then after Moldova, the Moldovan Principality and Wallachian Principality united in the mid-19th century, they basically started to disappear culturally uh, because they Romanized. They became Romanian. They lost their true, their true Moldovan identity. They lost their language. They lost their culture. They melted in this Romanian pot. Uh, they lost their language. Was the language, according to this theory, very different to Romanian? No, no. According to the theory, it wasn't that different, but still it was different. But anyway, they lost their true identity, but not all of them. It's a little bit like in this Asterix uh, cartoon, right? There was this, all region was Romanized, but not all. There was this one, one small village. And this one small village in the story is this territory of the Moldovan Principality, which was annexed before by Russia. Thanks to the fact I'm, I'm talking right now in the yeah with in the, w- Russian quotation in Russian marks. quotation exactly. Thanks to the fact that the Russian Empire annexed part of Moldova in 1812, people on this territory remained Moldovans. They kept their true identity, their true um, uh, fate, their true language, and so forth, and so and so on and so forth. Therefore, Soviet Union was only trying 
to revive this true identity, was only trying to give them place in the earth, on earth. They were was only trying to um, help them to actually uh, thrive as a, as a nation and to protect them from ruminization. And therefore, according to this ideology, Moldovan language was the official language of Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic, this, this original language of the Moldovan people, uh, written in the Cyrillic alphabet, not the Latin alphabet, and with all those uh, quirks and features of the Moldovan language which differentiate this language from the, from the uh, Romanian one. So, if right now, if today you will ask Moldovan uh, citizens, Moldovan people, about the language they are speaking, and you will get the answer, I'm speaking Moldovan, probably you will find, you, you will meet a person who is more willing to uh, identify with the, with this, let's say, post-Soviet narrative, who is probably a little bit more sentimental towards Soviet Union, towards Soviet past. Would these is, be slightly older people? Uh, older people are more prone to this way of thinking, that's true. Uh, but not only, not necessarily. I mean, there are also young people who, who can answer like that. Um, so, so this is kind of an ideological declaration. Those who are very much, very strongly claiming that, yes, we are speaking Moldovan language, tend to align with the... Uh, with Russia, with Russian culture, with Russian language, with uh, Russian uh, or post-Russian past, with the Soviet past, and so on and so forth. So this is political declaration. If someone is saying, no, it's obviously Romanian and I'm, I'm speaking Romanian, uh, it means that he, first of all, recognized the linguistic fact, and the, the, the second, that he's more open, more prone to actually uh, support... Um, European integration, Western model of development for Moldova, and so on and so forth. It doesn't mean that he need to be identifying himself as Romanian. That's the other thing. It doesn't mean that he need to support the idea of reunification of Moldova and Romania. It may, but it don't have to. Mm -hmm. And this is more or less how it works. It's complicated, unfortunately. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, every American who speaks English does not want to reunify with England. So Every, is it? Uh, I, I would say none of them, okay. <laughs> but I, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I've never seen any opinion polls about this, really. So. Neither have I. And there are in Moldova. Oh, okay. Of course, we, about unification, reunification with Romania. Um, right now, about 30 to 35 percent of Moldovans are supporting the idea of reunification, which is a uh, very uh, high number, because uh, normally, um, let's say 10 years ago, it was about 10 percent. Right mm. now, it's about 35 percent. Um, Okay, I would like to move on um, because we've discussed if there is a difference between the Romanian and Moldovan language, but there are citizens of Moldova who speak Russian. Yes. Where are they? Well, uh, again, it's not that easy. I mean, first of all, Russian is basically the second most popular language in the Republic of Moldova. And that's obviously the effect of the first Soviet and then uh, first Russian and the Soviet presence on the um, on the territory of this republic um, most of the older people uh, older than 40 years old obviously know Russian language because they were taught this language at school um, but some uh, of them are speaking Russian because it's really the first language we've got Russians in uh, Moldova it's only about four to five percent of the general population. We've got Ukrainians who are rather speaking Russian than Romanian. It's about five percent, six percent of the population. We've got uh, Gagaus people who are living in the um, Gagaus autonomy and uh, to the to the north uh, to the south um, in the southern region of of Moldova. It's about five to six percent of the general population. And despite the fact that their kind of native language is Gagausian language, which is an archaic Turkic language, uh, they, on the regular basis, on the daily basis, they use, they use Russian. And basically all minorities in this country, uh, be it Bulgarians, Poles, uh, Jewish people, and so on, they are using Russian as the language of the everyday communication. 
Uh, when it comes to uh, those minorities and where where they are, are located, it's mostly in the north of the country, around in, in the city of Belts and around the city of Belts, and to the south in Gagauzia and around and Taraklia as well. Taraklia is the region inhabited by ethnic Bulgarians. And of course, we haven't mentioned it yet, but of course, Transnistria and uh, separate uh, separatist um, uh, entity, separatist region um, between basically between the Dniester River and the border of Moldova and Ukraine, which is inhabited by around 350,000 people. Uh, it's definitely Russian uh, speaking. So we are now moving on to Transnistria and it may become complicated at this point. Not uh, more than it already was. So. Um, we, we can hope. Okay. How many Russian soldiers are stationed in Moldova? Again, that wouldn't be that easy to answer. Uh, I will ask you a question. What is a Russian soldier? Um, well, I'm not the expert in the room, I would say. Oh, well, in fact, I do not know. Uh, these people would be Moldovan citizens. So I guess I should ask you um, about the status of Transnistria. Is it a recognized independent state? And in that case, its soldiers would be... Um, the state soldiers. Oh, it's even more complicated. <laughs> uh, so when it comes to Transnistria, some Transnistria is not recognized by anyone. Uh, not I mean, even by Russia. Not even by Russia. Uh, actually, I mean, there are a few entities which are recognizing Transnistria, but they are not recognized uh, themselves. So uh, I'm talking about uh, the, 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 the quasi-recognized or unrecognized so-called states and uh, and the Caucasus, for example, right? So this is this is it. So Transnistria is not recognized. But when it comes to military, I was asking you about the definition of Russian soldier, mm, not without the reason. So we've got we've got troops in Transnistria who are serving for and or s s s serving in the Russian military, who are wearing Russian uniforms with Russian flag and so on and so forth. And obviously they do have Russian passports and Russian citizenship. Uh, but most of them right now are actually locals. So they are the people from Transnistria. And now why? Uh, and they would not have Russian flags on the... Okay, I will, I will start from the beginning because, yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite messy. Um, Russians have about 1,500 1, soldiers under their command with Russian flags and Russian citizenship um, serving in Transnistria. There are two groups uh, which um, combined uh, have, have this 1,500 1, people there. Uh, first are the Russian peacekeeping forces, which are there since the end of the Transnistrian-Moldovan conflict, so-called Transnistrian-Moldovan conflict, uh, which ended in 1991. Uh, this conflict ended with a peace treaty, or, the, or rather the agreement between Moldova and Russia, not Transnistria. And according to this agreement, Russia can have peace uh, keepers on the territory of Transnistria. And part of those troops are there according to this uh, treaty and it's about 400, uh, four, 450 people, about 500, right? The, another 1,000, 1, because both of those groups consist of 1,500, as I said before, are the members of so-called uh, operational group of Russian um, troops or a Russian army. Uh, this is the remainant of the 14th Russian army, which was stationed in the region since like since forever. It was before that it was called uh, 14th Soviet army. It was simply located in the territory of Transnistria. This army took place, took an active role in the conflict of 1991. Actually, this, this army helped uh, Transnistria to defend its independence from Moldova. Um, most of troops uh, were there uh, when after the war were actually relocated to Russia, but this 1,000, uh, let's say, brigade or a group remained in, in Transnistria. So we've got 1,000 people from this group, 500 from the peacekeeping forces, it's about 1,500. Uh, um, the problem is, from the Russian perspective, of course, that since 2014, so since Russia started its invasion on Ukraine, uh, uh, Moscow is unable to rotate 
the troops in um, uh, Transnistria. Ukraine, of course, is not allowing Russia to transport any troops through its territory. And Moldova uh, started to, uh, I mean, refused since, since in, in 2014, officially, in 2014, officially refused to um, accept any rotations through the mm-hmm. Kishinev airport. Therefore, in and order the, and to... And they are the only borders. And they are the only borders. Yeah, Russia right. don't have any direct border with uh, Moldova, with Transnistria as well, of course. And therefore, if Russia would like to change the troops, to rotate the troops, uh, it needs to do it uh, based on the, let's say, local resources. So what Russia is doing? Russia is simply taking local Russians, so the people with Russian passports which are living in Transnistria, and there are about uh, 150 to 200,000 people with Russian passports then, and are simply... Um, uh, signing a contract with them to serve in the Russian military. So most of those Russian soldiers in Transnistria are actually Transnistrian soldiers who are serving under the Russian flag and under Russian command. So this is why I ask you uh, about the definition of the Russian army. Only the officers, like at least the most of the officers, are really from the Russian uh, army, are really coming from Russia, are really serving um, as, as a true Russian soldiers. But despite them being local people, they are not loyal to Kishinev. They are definitely not loyal, loyal to Kishinev. Um, the Transnistria, uh, and this is another I- I- issue, Transnistria have its own army. Despite this 100, uh, 1,500 uh, troops, uh, Transnistria have got an uh, army which consists of about five to 7,000 troops. It depends. There are different numbers. Uh, some of them are uh, as uh, high as 15,000, even 20,000, but probably they are also including uh, all the militia uh, members or the KGB members, generally speaking, law enforcement um, uh, officers. So in this case, yeah, it would be probably around 15,000 people. Um, so this is how it looks. And we don't have any doubts that Transnistrian army is also under maybe not that direct control of Russia uh, and 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 uh, Russian military as well. But the core is 1,500 people. Okay. So, Camille, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like and subscribe.